<clears throat> Greetings. Welcome to Journey to the Holy Land. This is Father Paul Joseph at St. Margaret Mary Catholic Church. We are continuing our journey in preparation for our pilgrimage to Israel that leaves in less than two weeks. So let's take a moment and bow our heads in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks once again for this opportunity to walk where your son Jesus walked, to see the places he saw, to see the places where he performed his miracles, told his parables, where he died on the cross, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. Because he has brought us the message of salvation, the message of eternal life. And loving God, I call upon your blessings on all of us here today, the <clears throat> Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last session, or first session, we did an overview of the Middle East, the 14 countries, seven of which are mentioned in the Old Testament. We looked at the idea of where these places are. We looked at maps. We talked about their history and everything. And then in last session, number two, we went into specifically into Israel, the land of Jesus. And we covered the northern part of the country. Now, I'm going to go back here to the map. And I know that this is a little, a little hard to see on the computer. But remember, this is the area of Galilee in the north, Samaria in the middle point, Judea in the south. And last time we continued, went, went from Tel Aviv, we flew, landed in our plane, our airport, <clears throat> up to the shore of the Sea of Galilee, went to Cana, Nazareth, down the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized, went to the Mount of Temptations, and that's where we left off in our last session. Today we are going to do the southern part of Israel referred to as Judea, where we'll spend the second part of our pilgrimage. We'll see the Dead Sea, where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. We'll go to Jerusalem, Bethany, Bethlehem, and Emmaus. So we look forward to this journey. Now, you're probably wondering why I'm wearing a hat today. For everybody on our pilgrimage, we are going to encourage you to wear a hat because the sun can be a little intense. It's not going to be blistering hot like Las Vegas or Palm Springs, but the sun will be a bit intense. Find your favorite hat. This is one of my favorites. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And if you look closely, it says, I love Jesus. Okay, we have our outlines here. The outline says, journey through the Holy Land, session number two, Israel, the southern part. During the second part of our pilgrimage, we will visit the places in the southern part of Israel where Jesus was born, where he gave us Holy Communion for the first time where he died on the cross, where he rose from the dead, and where he ascended into heaven. So as I said, last week we left off on our journey heading south from the Sea of Galilee along this River Jordan. We go to the place where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. The voice of God came from above, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then we continue down through the Mount of Temptations. <clears throat> this is the approximate area where Jesus spent the 40 days in the desert and the time that we refer to as Lent is the time after he was baptized, before he began his ministry. So as we continue down the Jordan River, we get to the Dead Sea. Remember, the Sea of Galilee is a freshwater lake. There's plenty of fishing there, excellent fish. It flows south into the Jordan River and then down into the Dead Sea. So letter A, the Dead Sea and Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Sea of Galilee flows south into the River Jordan, and the River Jordan then empties into the Dead Sea. What type of plants or fish live in the Dead Sea? None. Why not? Because of the high level of salt from the surrounding hills. The level of salt is about three times as salty as the Pacific Ocean. That's why you see people floating in the Dead Sea, reading books and newspapers, because of the high salt content. When I went to, their, to the Holy Land in May of 1994, our guides told the women, three days before we go to the Dead Sea, if you're planning on swimming in the Dead Sea, do not shave your legs. Why not? Because of the high salt content in the water. So the Dead Sea is significant. Because in 1947, a young boy was tending some sheep near Qumran, a town on the shore of the Dead Sea. One of the sheep that he was taking care of <clears throat> wandered into a cave. While searching in the cave for the sheep, the boy found a large jar sealed very tightly. Upon opening it, he found the oldest copies of the Old Testament that we have. These are the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were wrapped very tightly, put in these jars, sealed and left for almost 2,000 years. 
They believed that they was replaced here by a group called the Essenes. And the Essenes were a religious group, very dedicated to the sacred scriptures, which at that time was the Old Testament. The Old Testament had not yet been written. And what was happening, we can tell, is that they were under attack. And they knew that they were going to have to flee, but they anticipated coming back. So what they did is they put the Dead Sea Scrolls in these jars, sealed them, put them in the caves, thinking that someday they would come back. Well, they didn't come back, but because the land was so dry, so arid, and the jars were sealed so tight, the scrolls were actually well preserved. And what biblical scholars have done is have studied these ancient texts. They put them all together. What they did is they laid them out flat on plexiglass, put another sheet of plexiglass on top of them, did a process called hermetically sealing, where they suck the air out of it, and that way they're preserved. They're in a museum in Jerusalem called the Museum of the Book. I remember going there in 1994. You could pull these drawers out with the plexiglass, with the Dead Sea Scrolls under the glass. We're actually able to see the oldest copies of the Bible. And biblical scholars have found that these ancient texts are incredibly close to the text that we use today. It shows how accurate the translations are and how accurate the scriptures have been passed down from generation to generation. So this is at the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea Scrolls. From there, we will go into Jerusalem, the largest city in Israel, and it's the holy city for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. This city was first mentioned in the Bible during the time of Abraham, approximately 2000 BC, when it was known as Salem, a word, word that means peace. Remember, Melchizedek, the high priest, encountered Abraham in the uh, city of Salem, now known as Jerusalem, and Melchizedek offered to do his tithing, one-tenth of everything. Now, much later, about a thousand years later, in approximately 1000 BC, King David captured the city from the Jebusites and made it his capital and brought into it the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is not Noah's Ark. The Ark of the Covenant was a box made out of acacia wood that held the Ten Commandments. When I was in Israel in 1994, we started talking about the Ten Commandments, uh, talking about the um, Ark of the Covenant, because in the synagogue in Capernaum that we talked about last time, there is a carving and a rock that looks very similar to what the Ark of the Covenant probably looked like. The people put the Ark of the Ten Commandments in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant has disappeared over the years during the Babylonian exile. The, ba the Babylonians drove the Hebrew people out of Israel into Babylon and modern day Iraq. They looted all the items of the temple. That's the last that we hear of the Ark of the Covenant. But if you look in the Old Testament, in the second book of Maccabees, there's a story about Jeremiah hiding the Ark of the Covenant in a cave and chastising the people who went to look for it because they said the Ark of the Covenant will be found at a time that is suitable in God's plan. Now, I was talking to some of the guides that we had in 1994 when we were in Israel, and I said, do you have any idea where the Ark of the Covenant is? And they said, go rent Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's a movie with Harrison Ford. It was made in the 1980s. It is a very entertaining movie. It talks about them going in search of the Ark of the Covenant. Historical accuracy, less than 1%. Enjoyable, I got a kick out of it. I watch it every year when I read about the Ark of the Covenant. So we do not know where the Ark of the Covenant is, but that's where it was at the time in 1000 BC when David brought it into Jerusalem. Now, in approximately 960 BC, David's son, King Solomon, built the first temple, and it was a sacred place of worship for the Jews for almost 400 years. But then, in 587 BC, that first temple was destroyed, and the Jews were exiled to Babylon, and which became known as the Babylonian exile. My phone just beeped because I forgot to put it on silent. It is now on silent. Okay. So in approximately 960 BC, King Solomon built the first temple, and it was a sacred place of worship for the Jews for almost 400 years. In 587 BC, the temple, first temple was destroyed, Jews were exiled to Babylon, and what became known as the Babylonian exile. This is the last that we hear of the Ark of the Covenant, except for that comment in the second book of Maccabees and the Old Testament. Now, about 50 years later, the Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem 
and their second temple was built under the leadership of Ezra in 515 BC. This temple continued right up to the time of King Herod. King Herod was, I should say evil is probably an understatement, but he wanted to endear himself to the Jewish people. So he had an idea. This temple is 400 years old. I'm not going to tear it down and build a new one, but I will do an extensive remodel on it. And that's exactly what King Herod did starting in 20 BC. He became, began an extensive remodel of the temple. But then the temple was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. The only remaining wall of the temple is part of a retaining wall known as the Western Wall. And we'll get to that in section H. This is not part of the, oh, this is not a wall of the original temple. It's a wall of the retaining, restraining wall around the temple, the uh, retaining wall that surrounded it. In 6691, remember AD is Anno Domini in the year of our Lord, contrast to BC, AD is what we're in now. In AD 691, the Muslims constructed a mosque that is called the Dome of the Rock. It is a very sacred place for our Muslim brothers and sisters. And it's there to this day. We will see the big gold dome on the Dome of the Rock. As we talked about last time, the Dome of the Rock is built over the site of the original temple. In the Dome of the Rock is a huge rock. Many of our Jewish brothers and sisters believe that that is what's called Mount Moriah, that that is where Abraham took his son Isaac on the instructions from God to sacrifice him. As we know, the angel of the Lord stopped Abraham, said God was just testing you. He told you that your descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands in the seashore. So Isaac was not sacrificed. But many of our Jewish brothers and sisters believe that this is the rock where Abraham took Isaac called Mount Moriah. Our Muslim brothers and sisters believe that this is the place where Muhammad ascended into heaven. However, there's no evidence that Muhammad was ever in Jerusalem. Some people believe that he had a dream that he ascended into heaven. We're not exactly sure, but it is a sacred place for the Muslims right now. And our Jewish brothers and sisters will pray at that Western wall or retaining wall right next to the Dome of the Rock. As I mentioned last time, would it be appropriate for us as Christians to pray at the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall or even in the Dome of the Rock? And my answer is, <clears throat> we can pray anywhere at any time. God always hears our prayers. <clears throat> and a reminder, Pope John Paul II prayed at the Western Wall, and I did as well in May of 1994. For Christians, the temple in Jerusalem, the one that was destroyed by the Romans, was a sacred place where Jesus was presented in the temple when he was 40 days old. That's what we celebrate on February 2nd, the presentation of the Lord. He was found by Mary and Joseph in the temple when he was 12 years old. Remember, they traveled south from Nazareth to go to Jerusalem for the Passover every year. Mary and Joseph started to head back with all of their family and friends. Guess what? Jesus was not with them. They went back three days later. They found Jesus in the temple, and the scholars were amazed at the questions he was answering, asking and the quest answers that he was giving them. As an adult, <clears throat> Jesus went there often to pray and to celebrate feasts such as the Passover. There are three Passovers mentioned in John's gospel. That's why many biblical scholars believe that Jesus' met, uh, ministry lasted about three years because he went to pass the Jerusalem for the Passover each year. The last Passover that he went, this is when Jesus drove out the money changers and those who were selling animals with his famous words, this is my father's house. It is a house of prayer, and you have turned it into a den of thieves. Now, why were they selling animals? Why did they have money changers? The idea of selling animals, so you would have an animal for the sacrifice. Let's say you traveled a long way with an animal, and your animal died halfway there. Well, you can't sacrifice a dead animal, so you have to buy a new animal. Well, here's the problem. Israel is a Roman uh, colony. Everybody has Roman money, but you can't use Roman money in the temple. You have to have Hebrew money. But I have a friend over here who will exchange your Roman money into Hebrew money at a very favorable exchange rate. So go over and see my friend and come back and buy my animal. It had turned into a marketplace. And that's why Jesus said, this is my father's house. It is a house of prayer and you have turned it into a den of thieves. Now, in Jerusalem, there's a section referred to as the Old City. That's where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is. 
the tomb of Jesus, where Jesus died and where he rose from the dead. And we will go into the old city and <clears throat> have some time there. The old city is divided into four sections. The Jewish quarter, the Christian quarter, the Muslim quarter, and the Armenian quarter. Each of these areas has an incredible story about how they came about, and our guides will give us much more history and background, more than I could include here. But obviously, Jewish people because of King David, Christians because of Jesus, Muslims because of Muhammad. Uh, the Armenians, I'm, I'm really not sure, but I'm sure our guides will give us plenty of information on that. Not far away from Jerusalem is the town of Bethlehem. And how do we know that it is close to Jerusalem? On that first Christmas, the Magi followed the stars that led them to where Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But did they go to Bethlehem first? No, because the star stopped over that general area, but they weren't exactly sure where Jesus, where the newborn king was to be born. I don't think they knew him as Jesus quite yet, but they did not know where the newborn king was to be born. The Magi were wealthy. They were people of prominence. They had great gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. As a result, they were able to get a meeting with King Herod. And they said to King Herod, where is the newborn king to be born? Now, this is the same King Herod who just did this incredible remodel on the temple, but he didn't have a clue. He didn't care about the scriptures, and he certainly didn't care about a newborn king. So he said to the scribes, the scholars of the law, go search the scriptures and find out where the newborn king is to be born. They did, and they found in the book of the prophet Micah that he would be born in Bethlehem. And so the Magi left to go to Bethlehem to present their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But before they left, King Herod said to them, come back. When you find him, come back. Tell me where he is so I too may go and worship him. Wow. Probably one of the greatest lies in human history. He had no interest in worshiping anybody other than himself. So he sat there and waited patiently for the Magi to return. As we know, the Magi were warned in a dream not to go back to Jerusalem. They returned to their home country by another route. Herod sat and waited, waited and waited. The Magi never came back. He says, I've got to get rid of this newborn baby, the king of the Jews. I don't know who he is. So he had his soldiers kill all the boy babies under two years of age. Why didn't the soldiers kill the baby girls? Because it was a newborn king, not a newborn queen. So all this happened at that time of the birth of Jesus. And people say, was well, that how Jesus died? No, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, said, take Mary and the baby, flee to Egypt and stay there until it was safe to return. They stayed in Egypt when King Herod died and went back to their hometown of Nazareth. Okay, so now let us see Bethlehem and the shepherd's field. Bethlehem, a word that means house of bread, has long been known as the city of David, named after King David. When Caesar Augustus ordered a census of the world, Joseph and Mary had to travel 90 miles to Bethlehem to be counted because Joseph was of the house and the family of David. And 90 miles, it's about an hour and a half drive, right? Maybe two hours. But they weren't driving, they were walking. And they had a long journey of 90 miles, which is a long way when you think about it, traveling at that time in the period. In the Gospel of Luke, oh, let me back up a second. And they, they went to uh, Bethlehem because Joseph was of the house and family of David. On that first Christmas day, Jesus was born. In the Gospel of Luke, we hear of the shepherds tending their shield in the shepherd's field. While Luke makes no mention of the shepherds seeing the star that the Magi saw, they were visited by the heavenly host of angels who gave them the good news of the birth of our Lord and Savior. And he will, here we will celebrate mass at an outdoor altar in the shepherd's field. There's a big church, this big place, the church here called the Church of the Nativity. It was built over the site of where Jesus was born. But I'm going to back up for a second here. Matthew tells us the Magi follow the star. Luke tells us that the shepherds did not see a star at all, but they saw the angels. And the angel said, I bring you good news for today in the city of David, the city of Bethlehem, a savior is born who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. <coughs> Excuse me. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. 
And then the heavenly host of angels appeared, singing glory to God in the highest. Every year at Christmas, we hear that at Mass. And then every year during the Christmas season, hopefully we watch the Charlie Brown Christmas special. Because remember, that's the one where Linus, his friend, quoted the Gospel of Luke. That television program was produced in 1965. Charles Schulz was the writer of the Peanuts characters. And he was interviewed before he died. And he said that the television networks were having trouble with the idea of putting this program on. And the big concern they had was having a cartoon character quoting from sacred scripture. Was America ready for that in 1965? My answer is, we were ready in 1965 and we are ready today. And the idea of Linus quoting that scripture was because Charlie Brown was confused and frustrated about the commercialism of Christmas. Gee, 1965, look at our world today. Finally, he asked the question, can somebody tell me the true meaning of Christmas? He was frustrated because they had a contest, a house decorating contest. And remember who won the house decorating contest? His dog Snoopy. And Charlie Brown was so frustrated, even my own dog has gone commercial. Can somebody tell me the meaning of Christmas? And Linus says, sure, Charlie Brown, I'll tell you. Walks out on the stage, says, lights please, and quotes this passage from the Gospel of Luke. Now, People have asked questions about how characters and comics and television shows get their names. Linus is actually the name of our second Pope. Now, did Charles Schulz intentionally name Linus after our second Pope? We don't know, but Linus is the one who quoted from the Gospel of Luke on that television show in 1965. Okay, so we have Bethlehem where Jesus was born. And there was a church that was built over the site of where Jesus was born. The church of the nativity was built over the site where Jesus was born. And the grotto area, there's a large silver star on the floor with a hole in the middle of it, about that big. Traditionally, this is the site of where the manger was located 2,020 years ago. Written above the star are the words, Hic de Maria Verdine, Jesu Christus Natus Est which is Latin and English, that is here Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. When we were there, you were able to put your hand down inside that hole in the star, feel the ground. That is the traditional site of where the manger was. I've used the term traditional site a number of times because we don't always know exactly where an event happened. When we look at this uh, uh, River Jordan where Jesus was baptized, we will go to the place that most biblical scholars believe was the place of the baptism. But could it have been a mile north or a mile south? Sure, it's possible. I remember being on the Sea of Galilee on a boat, and we will take a boat trip on the Sea of Galilee. And one of the women on our trip pilgrimage asked one of the priests, I'm looking out all this water at the Sea of Galilee. Can you show me where Jesus walked on the water? We have no idea where Jesus walked on the water on the Sea of Galilee. Nobody put out buoys or markers. We don't have that known, and we don't know exactly where. But the fact that we're at the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus walked on the water, where he performed miracles, to me, that is the essence of a pilgrimage. If somebody says, okay, you're 10 feet off, you're 20 feet off, or even half a mile off, that to me is not significant. What's significant is we will be walking in the places where Jesus walked, we will see the places where he performed his miracles. So the Church of the Nativity was built over the site of where Jesus was born. Now, somebody on our pilgrimage in 1994 asked the question, do we have the manger? The manger was made of wood. If the manger was sealed with wonderful sealants and everything, it could have lasted three, four, five, six hundred years maybe. But nobody thought to take the manger and seal it with that type of wood. So most biblical scholars believe that the manger is long gone. Same with the Noah's Ark. It came to rest on Mount Ararat in Turkey. People have been looking for Noah's Ark for thousands of years. But again, it was made out of wood. It's probably deteriorated by now. But the fact is, when we go into the church in Bethlehem, we will be where Jesus was born. All right, letter D, the Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane. We're jumping ahead 33 years in Jesus' life. He has now given us Holy Communion at the Last Supper. And then after the Last Supper, 
they went out to the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane. This is a location where Jesus and his disciples went to pray after the Last Supper. Jesus prayed, but his disciples fell asleep. So Jesus asked them, can you not stay awake for one hour and pray? The answer turned out to be no. But they were soon awakened by the soldiers led by Judas who came to arrest Jesus. Now, isn't it interesting? Here they had just made their first Holy Communion. Now they're in the garden praying with Jesus and they're all falling asleep. But when the soldiers came, they were awakened. Now there's a beautiful church known as the Church of All Nations or the Church of the Agony that was built on the traditional site of the Agony of the Garden. It is in this church that we will celebrate mass. Now this is the Mount of Olives. Why is it called the Mount of Olives? Because of all the olive trees. And archeologists and botanists and biologists have studied a lot of these trees. And they said that many of these trees could be close to 2000 years old. If that's true, we will be walking among trees that were there at the time of Jesus. Other bee botanists have said, no, they're probably a little bit younger than that. But if they are, they were came from seeds of the trees that were at the time of Jesus. So I try not to get wrapped up in too much of like, well, this was the actual tree that Jesus leaned against, or that was, we are, will be in the Garden of Gethsemane at the Mount of Olives. This is where Jesus went to pray, and that's what we are called to pray is there as well. And that's why we'll celebrate Mass in the Church of the Agony of the Church of All Nations. Now, you're probably wondering why I have the Last Supper after the Agony in the Garden. I put this outline in the form of, the, of what we'll be seeing on our pilgrimage. So as we go on our pilgrimage, this is the order in which we will see the locations. But now we're gonna back up six or eight hours to the Last Supper. And this is letter E, Mount Zion, the upper room. On the night before Jesus died, he asked his disciples to go to a specific room to prepare to celebrate the Passover meal. It was here that Jesus called upon the power of the Holy Spirit to change the bread and wine into his body and blood and gave us Holy Communion for the first time. It is in the same room that Jesus appeared to his disciples twice on that first Easter Sunday night and again a week later. Remember, they were in the upper room with the doors and windows locked out of fear, but Jesus appeared to them and they were astounded. This was Jesus. But remember, Thomas was not with them. So when Thomas got back, the apostle said, we have seen the Lord. Thomas said, I will not believe until I can put my hands and the nail mark of his hands and my finger into his side. One week later, the apostles were all gathered together. This time Thomas was with them. Jesus appeared again. And he said to Thomas, take your hand or your finger and put it into the nail marks in my hand. Take your hand and put it into my side. And Thomas responded with those favorite, famous words, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, you have seen and have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. And that's why we walk by faith and not by sight. Thomas actually was able to put his finger in the nail marks and in his side. We are not because we walk by faith. Now, Mount Zion is also the site of the tomb of King David. Remember, King David lived about a thousand years before Jesus. He was the second king of the Jewish people. He was a good king as far as a leadership, family life, not so much, but we talked about that last time in our journey through the Bible. Now, we're going to go to the letter F, Church of St. Peter and Galicantu. This is a famous place that, uh, where Peter was after Jesus was arrested. And this is letter F, the Church of St. Peter and Galicantu. It was here that the house of the Jewish high priest Caiaphas, who presided over the first trial of Jesus after he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, why did Jesus have two trials? First, he was trial, tried by Caiaphas, the high priest, and he was convicted of blasphemy, making himself equal with God by saying he was the son of God. Punishment for that is death, death by stoning. As horrible as that is, it usually lasts less than an hour. But the leaders wanted Jesus to be crucified. The Jews couldn't do that, only the Romans did. That's why Jesus was then taken to Pontius Pilate. So on that first Holy Thursday night, after Jesus had been arrested, St. Peter was warming himself by the fire. And three times he was approached by people asking him if he was a follower of Jesus. 
Three times he denied Jesus. I do not even know the man. After Peter's third denial, the rooster crowed just as Jesus had predicted. Now, three times Peter said to Jesus, said to the people, I do not know Jesus. And then the rooster crowed just as Jesus had predicted. There's a church that was built on this site as a flight of ancient steps have been discovered the date to the time of Jesus. Since this was the shortest way from Gethsemane to the upper part of the city, it is very possible that the feet of Jesus walked on these very stones. I remember that so clearly 28 years ago in 1994, walking on those stones because those stones are proven to be ancient of the time of Jesus. And it's the shortest way from Gethsemane to the upper part of the city. There's a very high likelihood that Jesus walked on those stones. Now, letter G, this is the Via Della Rosa, the Way of Sorrows, and the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Remember, after Jesus was condemned to death by Caiaphas, then he was condemned to crucifixion by Pontius Pilate, the Roman procurator. So now, Jesus, the next morning, Good Friday, Jesus begins his way of the cross. And this is letter G, Via Della Rosa, the Way of Sorrows, and the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. It was here that Jesus was condemned to death, the first station. The 14 stations of the cross lead us from where Jesus was condemned to death and carried his cross through the streets of Jerusalem to Calvary, also known as Golgotha, or place of the skull. They say that this big rock at the time actually looked kind of like a skull. That's where the name came from. Here Jesus was crucified between two criminals and it is here that he gave up his spirit and returned to the heavenly kingdom. This is a Via de la Rosa, the 14 stations of the cross. Now on the top of page four, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is a large church. I mean, it's a, it's a big church. It was built over the site of Calvary where Jesus died and over his tomb. In the church, we will see an altar that was built over a rock that is part of Calvary. You'll see this altar in a glass case next to it, you see this huge rock that was there that from Calvary. And then we're going to walk a short distance in the church to pray at the tomb of Jesus. We will then celebrate Mass in the Blessed Sacrament Chapel. Now, I've told this in homilies before. If you've heard it before, bear with me. When I went there in 1994, I was asking God, what is it that you want me to do? What do you want me to do with my life? I have a good job. I love being an accountant. I love the people I work with. I worked for an excellent company. I had a house in Redondo Beach. I had a Mercedes. Life was good. Living the American dream. I was volunteering at Juvenile Hall in the Catholic Chaplains Program. Volunteering at Covenant House in Hollywood. I was a treasurer for the House of Ruth in East Los Angeles, set up by the Sisters of St. Joseph for homeless women and children. It was a pro bono free thing that I did because I love what the sisters were doing. But I kept asking myself, am I trying to serve two masters, God and money? So after we were at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, we had an afternoon off. And every, most of the people went back to the hotel. The younger people went back to the swimming pool. The older people went back and took naps. I went back to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And around the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is an area we can light candles. And I lit a candle just asking Jesus to help guide me in my discernment. I just want to know what you want me to do. Now, you're all waiting for the story about the booming voice from above or the flashing lights or the lightning. That does not happen to accountants. That happens to artists and poets and musicians, but not to accountants. That would freak us out. We wouldn't do well with that. But I did have a good sense of peace. And the rest of the pilgrimage, I remember talking to Father Robert and the other priests on the pilgrimage with us about my vocation story. Well, when I came back to California, I was involved in the 30-something group in my local parish. I was 39 years old, just barely made the age limit. And for the 30-something group, I decided I would show them my slides from the Holy Land. These are slides on a slide projector. This is not PowerPoint, okay? This is 1994. So I put in the bulletin just a little notice about the slides of the Holy Land for our 30-something group. In that same bulletin, Sister Kathleen Bryant, a religious sister of charity, who was at the time one of the vocation directors for the Archdiocese, the recruiting scouts, if you will, talent scouts for God, she put a notice in that same bulletin for Vocations Anonymous, the call that will not go away. 
had her name, her phone number. I called her and I said, I don't know if this is the booming voice of the lightning from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, but I would like to take you to lunch. There's a hamburger hamlet near my office. Would you like to have lunch with me and just, just talk for an hour? She said, great. We talked for an hour and it was amazing. Sister Kathleen grew up in San Clemente. Her father was a wealthy investment banker with Bateman Eichler Hill Richards. He and Dick Reardon owned the pantry, this restaurant right near the Staples Center. She never would have had to work a day in her life, but she entered the Religious Sisters of Charity, spent eight years in Zambia and Africa, and then became the vocation director. Right now, she is in leadership with the Sisters of St. Joseph in Ireland. Uh, she's in Dublin and continue to pray for all uh, the Religious Sisters of Charity, excuse me. So she's in Dublin with the Religious Sisters of Charity and leadership. And anyway, that's my story about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And I'm really looking forward to going back there and we will celebrate Mass in the Blessed Sacrament Chapel. Now, letter H, we mentioned this a minute ago, the Western Wall that surrounded the Second Temple. When the Second Temple was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70, the only part that remained was part of a retaining wall called the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. Again, this is a special place of prayer and remembrance for so many people of faith. Now, the Church of St. Anne, who is St. Anne? St. Anne and St. Joachim were the parents of Mary. They are not mentioned in any of the four Gospels by name, but in some of the what's called non-canonical Gospels, Gospels that were written but not included in the Bible because they were not considered to be inspired by the Holy Spirit, they are mentioned in their, one of those Gospels, and that's how we find their names. This is a traditional site of the home of Saints Anne and Joachim, the parents of the Blessed Virgin Mary, their names are not mentioned in any of the four Gospels, but other ancient writings identify them by name. We'll celebrate Mass at the Church of St. Anne. After Mass, we'll continue to the Pools of Bethesda. This is in the area of Jerusalem, where Jesus performed <coughs> excuse me, many of his healing miracles. The story was that many crippled people and lame people came to the waters of these pools, hoping to benefit from a healing when the waters were stirred up. There was a crippled man who could not get into the water. So the water is all being stirred up. People are being healed. And Jesus comes along and heals the man. This is at the pools of Bethesda, where Jesus performed many of his healing miracles. Then we go to Ein Karim, or Ein Karim. When Mary found out that she was pregnant with Jesus, remember the Annunciation, this took place in Nazareth in the northern part in Galilee, the angel Gabriel slipped in something right at the end. By the way, Mary, your relative Elizabeth, who is advanced in years and was thought to be barren, is now in the sixth month of her pregnancy, for nothing is impossible with God. Who was she pregnant with? St. John the Baptist. Scripture tells us that Mary went in haste to Elizabeth, visit Elizabeth and stayed with her for three months. So pregnant Mary traveled all the way down to Ein Karim, which is just outside Jerusalem, probably 80 or 90 miles, stayed with her for three months. Why three months? Because Elizabeth was in her sixth month. Mary stayed with her right up until the birth of John the Baptist. So we will then visit the Church of the Visitation and the Church of St. John the Baptist. Now, people have asked the question, Mary traveling all that way pregnant, did she travel by herself? Did someone go with her? What, what happened here? Well, as Father Dan Harrington, a Jesuit scripture scholar, used to say, the text is not clear. We don't know who she traveled with, how long it took, or anything. People complain because the Bible is too thick. My complaint is it's too thin. I wish it were twice as thick and answered a lot of these questions. But we'll get those all answered when we get to heaven. Okay, all these places that we're going to are in the area of Jerusalem. They seem to be skipping around on the outline in the life of Jesus, but I put them in the order in which we will visit them. Letter L, Emmaus. On that first Easter Sunday, <clears throat> Jesus began, began a journey to Emmaus, a town that is about seven miles from Jerusalem. Here he encountered two of his disciples, but they did not recognize him. How is it that they didn't recognize Jesus? Again, biblical scholars have raised a question. 
Why didn't Mary Magdalene recognize him when she was at the tomb? She saw this man in the garden, assumed he was the gardener, and said, sir, if you have taken the body of my Lord and Savior, what have you done with it? Jesus called her by name, Mary, and she answered, Rabboni, which means teacher. Mary Magdalene did not recognize him. Same thing happened with the apostles on the way to the disciples on the way to Emmaus. Maybe Jesus looked different in a resurrected form, or maybe after they'd seen him die, they didn't expect to ever see him again. So how could this possibly be Jesus? So on the road to Emmaus, he encounters two of his disciples, but they did not recognize him. The three of them got into a discussion where the two disciples began to tell Jesus about everything that happened to Jesus over those last three days. They're telling Jesus what happened to him, not recognizing who he was. Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them what referred to him all the scriptures. They get to the journey at the end of the day. Jesus plans to continue on. The disciples said, won't you stay and eat with us? Jesus did, and they recognized Jesus. How did they recognize Jesus? In the breaking of the bread. Okay, last page here, letter M, Jaffa or Jampa. This is a coastal town just south of Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is where the airport is, right on the coast of the Mediterranean. This is where St. Peter raised Tabitha to life. Remember, she was the one, everybody thought she was dead. Jesus said, no, she is only sleeping. And he tells her, Talitha Kum, get up, and she did. And this is where St. Peter had a vision in which God asked him to preach the good news of the gospel to the Gentiles. Who were the Gentiles? The non-Jews. You're either a Jew or a Gentile, one or the other. And you there, he received the message to preach the good news to the Gentiles. Remember, St. Paul started preaching the message to the Gentiles before St. Peter did. St. Peter was thinking, wait a second, this message is for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So there was a conflict between them. Well, then Peter has this vision, which God asked him to preach the good news of the gospel to the Gentiles. And then as we read in the Acts of the Apostles, they got into another discussion. Do you have, if you're a Gentile, a non-Jew, do you have to become Jewish before you can become Christian? Well, they had the Council of Jerusalem, in which case they decided no, but there were certain things that you had to respect of the Jewish tradition. You could not um, eat the meat of strangled animals, you had to obey certain marriage restrictions. You couldn't marry your brother or your sister. And there were other provisions like that. But then everybody was welcomed into the faith because as we know, Jesus came for the message of salvation for everyone. Now our last one, letter N, Tel Aviv. We are now back to where our pilgrimage began, ready to board our flight back to the United States. We will return with many wonderful memories and stories to tell of how the Holy Land pilgrimage impacted our prayer lives. And we will have many experiences to draw on as we read the sacred scriptures and deepen our relationship with our Lord and Savior. I remember going to the Holy Land, this is before the seminary, before the priesthood, and being in a way clueless about a lot of things. I mentioned this before, but the Kidron Valley, when you're standing at the Mount of Olives at Gethsemane, looking into Jerusalem, you're looking over the Kidron Valley. I always thought the Kidron Valley was like the San Fernando Valley or the San Gabriel Valley. It is not. It is a gully. It is a cemetery with a lot of Jewish tombs, but you can look right over the Kidron Valley and see the city of Jerusalem. So a lot of things like that, as we read the scriptures after our pilgrimage, we're going to have a new awareness of like, okay, now I see where the Mount of Olives was. Jerusalem is right over here and a lot of places like that. So here's my conclusion. Now you have an idea of some of the places we will visit during the second half of our pilgrimage. Each one plays a significant role in the life of our Lord and Savior, and each place will have an impact on our prayer life, our spirituality, and our relationship with our loving God. When I was in the Holy Land in May of 1994, someone on our pilgrimage referred to the Holy Land as the fifth gospel, and I agreed because we walked where Jesus walked. Again, thank you for spending this time with me today on these last, all these three sessions. I'm gonna hold the map up once more. <clears throat> I don't know if this is helpful or not, but 
This, I'm gonna take a, this is a map where we have where Jesus walked, then and now. So we're gonna concentrate on them. In our second session, the Northern part, there's Galilee, there's the Sea of Galilee that flows down the Jordan River, down to the Dead Sea. We get to the Southern part of Judea. There we're going to see Jerusalem. We'll see Jericho, Bethlehem, Bethany, Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. We'll go to Emmaus. We'll go to Ein Karam. We'll go to wonderful places on our journey. This is a map of Israel as it is today, where you can see still the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. Jerusalem is still there. Bethany is still there. Jericho is still there. And you notice across the Jordan River is the country of Jordan. When you look at the Sea of Galilee, the north uh, eastern part is referred to as the Golan Heights. This is all the area in which we'll be visiting on our pilgrimage. So for those of you who are going on the pilgrimage, we're very much looking forward to our journey. If you're not going on this pilgrimage, we thank you for joining us during these three sessions and pray for us while we're on our pilgrimage. Pray for peace in Israel. We have three religions that call it their religious home. All three of them worship the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. This is Jews, Christians, and Muslims. People ask, when did the Jewish faith begin? Some people say with Adam and Eve. Well, Adam and Eve never really considered themselves Jews. It really didn't happen until the time of Abraham, where they're referred to as Hebrews, and then, then about 2000 BC, then they became Israelites, and then they became Jews. Somebody mentioned to me, think of it alphabetically, H-I-J, Hebrews, Israelites, and Jews. Well, let's bow our heads in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for this opportunity once again to journey through the Holy Land. We ask that you continue to bless us and guide us as we walk in the places where Jesus walked. We see where he performed his miracles, where he told his parables. We look forward to seeing where Jesus gave us the Holy Communion for the first time, the Eucharist, where he died on the cross, rose from the dead, and brings us the message of salvation. And for those of you who will not be on the pilgrimage, know that you will be in our prayers as well as we walk together as a community of faith. And loving God, I call upon your blessings on all of us here today, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, and I'll see you soon. And next time, we, after the pilgrimage, we'll go back to journey through the Bible and the Old Testament, the first book of Chronicles.